Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. As you just heard, I'm, amongst other things, a co-director of an INSERM uh, unit in France. Uh, being, uh, this is a unit uh, in particular focused on system neurosciences, uh, attached to which we have an epilepsy uh, unit, so an uh, in-clinic uh, unit. And that characterizes actually some of our work quite well. We're trying to carry uh, theoretical neuroscience, mathematical principles from uh, the theory through brain network, large-scale brain network modeling, all the way into the clinic. And this is effectively what I'd like to uh, speak about to you today. Uh, it's entitled The Virtual Brain, a simulator for large-scale brain network dynamics. And what I will do is I will move uh, conceptually, theoretically, uh, a little in between the last two talks that you heard yesterday. On the one hand side, we will talk about connectivity. On the other hand, we will talk about uh, simulating, performing simulations uh, as realistically as possible on a chosen level of uh, description. So large-scale brain networks, a few words on those to motivate our entry point that we have chosen over the last almost 20 years by now, actually, when what you see here is a tag cloud from the series of uh, frontiers in neurosciences, and there uh, you scale, uh, to, you take the keywords, the keywords have been taken from this series, and basically whenever the keywords appeared, uh, it entered into an index, and this index scales uh, the appropriate keyword, and you see the predominant position of fMRI here in particular, and when you go to PubMed and type in functional connectivity, brain, and MRI, just in uh, the last year, 28% of all citations with regard to this occurred only in the last year out of uh, a total of 3,000 since 1994. Yeah, so connectivity starts, connectivity-based thinking starts playing a an important and prominent role in the neuroimaging community. Connectivity, there are two things, at least two definitions to be considered. One is the structural anatomical connectivity that is defined by the set of all existing connections, in my case, between brain areas. Number one, functional connectivity is a set of uh, relationships between two areas. And relationship is a very general expression. It depends on what metric you choose to characterize the functional, the dynamic relationship between two areas. So this is a working definition I'd like to use for functional connectivity. Um, what we heard yesterday, uh, we heard uh, Michael talk about biomarkers, and that's the famous citation that he uh, brought up also. So one of the hopes is that we can use functional connectivity uh, as a biomarker uh, to at least to distinguish uh, uh, patient populations from a healthy population. And there seem systematically we do find differences in uh, uh, pathologies ranging from uh, Alzheimer, epilepsy, schizophrenia. Uh, mem uh, also obesity and epilepsy. One of the problems so, that we run into this is um, much statistical significance we find on the group level, but the individual uh, predictability for a single patient is very low, and there is a large inter and intra-subject uh, variability. And uh, what the belief is, is that this may be due to the metrics that we're applying. We're not applying a good metric. We know that uh, resting state activity, in particular, to which the functional connectivity uh, uh, metrics are being applied, uh, is non-stationary. Yeah? And many of the metrics require a stationarity in order to make uh, meaningful predictions. So we are in the process to learn about that and uh, reorienting our think uh, thinking towards addressing these issues through better metrics, but also through modeling in order to understand this, uh, the, these phenomena in there, yeah? through large-scale brain network modeling. And that's a mindset in which I would like to have you. Like, 
as you see here, when you decompose a branch into the major branches and the individual needles, you lose many of uh, the topological, or you use, all, lose all the topological features, and some aspects of function are not apparent anymore when you look at this. Some uh, uh, local aspects of local processing still will be present in each needle, but only through the topology on a certain macroscopic level, uh, a functional meaning becomes apparent. And that's a mindset that I ask you to have. Uh, since uh, with the type of network-based, large-scale ba uh, network-based modeling that we per uh, perform, uh, this, these are the properties that we would like to explore. What are the functional consequences upon large-scale brain network dynamics imposed by the constraints of, uh, due to topology of the connectivity? Yeah? And um, one of the big differences when you perform large-scale brain network modeling is that it is still a network, but your nodes change. They are not single neurons anymore, number one. You deal with local connectivity, which is roughly 50% of all the fibers are intracortical. Yeah? But the other 50% leave the gray matter and perform long distance uh, connections to far distant areas. And there, when you look at the propagation speeds that can vary from one to 10 uh, meter per second, you run into time delays that are on the time scale that can range to multiple tens of milliseconds, 40, 50, 60 milliseconds, depending on the length of the fiber. So that they are on a time scale that is important for the dynamics occurring in each of these uh, network nodes, which occurs also on the time scale of multiple tens of milliseconds. So that's not ignorable, and computationally that plays a very important role, because suddenly uh, all stochastic implementations become much more sensitive uh, uh, with regard to convergence. Uh, you have to carry a history along, yeah, because you have to have for, let's say, 100 milliseconds, all the memory for the entire network in order to perform the simulation, etc. So there are issues and consequences for simulations on this type of level of modeling. Um, historically, this, uh, things like this, uh, or this line of thinking has been performed uh, for more than 20 years. Here are some uh, publications of this form. Neural field modeling has been put forward uh, in the 70s by Wilson and Cowan, Nunes, and there. Uh, what was missing at that time is the detailed information about the large-scale connectivity on the brain and network level. We had subsystems, but we didn't have the topological structure of the connectivity. So approximations were made, homogeneous approximations, of which we know that many of those uh, give us nicely the temporal features of the network dynamics, but not the spatial, on, not at all the spatial temporal features. So there was basically an outcry for better connectivity information. And uh, the first type of modeling using the large scale connectivity information uh, was performed here by, sorry, by, uh, so it was provided by Kutter and Wanke. And uh, then the first implementations are, of, are listed here. And that has given a boom to this large-scale brain connectivity modeling, in particular ones, data also from DTI-based uh, information entered, allowed, uh, allowing modeling using uh, two hemispheres and uh, subcortical structures. Many applications have been uh, performed with regard to resting state dynamics. Right now, uh, the first publications are coming out with regard to applications to pathologies such as lesions and uh, epilepsy. I'll give you a, a more detailed example at the end of my talk with regard to epilepsy. What are the network nodes in such a large-scale brain network? It's not individual neurons. So we have to make the level of abstraction from individual uh, neurons to what is called neural mass models. We collect the neurons or their neural dynamics in populations, and then 
you have to make a leap of faith. You have to apply a certain metric in order to compress the information. Uh, and the leap of faith is what do you believe that is actually being coded uh, within this population? Is it firing rate? Is it the degree of synchronization? Is it spike timing, etc.? And depending on uh, uh, this belief, uh, there is a mathematical, or mathematical toolbox that allows you to perform reductions to allow, arrive at what we call the neural mass models, where uh, like a synchronization index is being reduced to a variable that evolves uh, temporally in time. Yeah? So these are the population models. Firing rate would be, for instance, uh, the uh, well-known Wilson and Cohen model. There is an issue, though, and this issue we run into also already on the single neuron level, and that is the uh, existence of... Um, or the absence of bijectivity. In other words, when you have a single neuron there, uh, so, and you describe it, take a, a multi-compartment approach, for instance, yeah, uh, there are uh, tons of different parameter distributions that can give rise to the same emergent dynamics already on the single neuron level. This is in particular work by uh, modern Goya, he nicely reviewed the Nature Review Neuroscience, where they have this cartoon based on their empirical data, where they nicely represented in this cartoon. Imagine you have three parameters, parameter A, B, and C, and then you plot uh, the different realizations that giving ra of parameters within one single neuron uh, that give rise to the same characteristic uh, temporal signature. Here you have one temporal signature, so one characteristic behavior. Here you have another one. And they are lying on so-called manifolds. Uh, which means this parameter configuration gives you the same uh, identical dynamics as this parameter configuration. If it's convex like this, if you take the average over all parameters, actually you're obtaining a behavior that has absolutely nothing to do with uh, the dynamics that you actually want to observe because it's outside of this manifold. So when you make this step from spatial properties, spatial features, parameters, to actually the temporal features, uh, the, there is a certain difficulty involved that must not be uh, underestimated. And I'll... Uh, uh, what we do in order to overcome that, in neural mass modeling in particular, we're trying to understand the invariant features that are present within a dynamics. And this is typically done through the phase flow topology. What this means is actually you can characterize the, all the dynamics that you observe here on this uh, um, parameter manifold. You can... Uh, characterize it by a low-dimensional set of differential equations that gives you a particular dynamics. And this dynamics for 2D, and most of the neural mass models are arranged from 2 to 12 dimensions, yeah? you can uh, represent this in a state space. And then uh, what you find there, th this, these mathematical equations give you a flow in the state space. And here you have a trajectory when you're sitting here, the system evolves towards a particular fixed point. So what you have here is a topology that is often used in uh, decision making where you have a bistable scenario, one stable fixed point, another stable fixed point. So you have bistability here, and this, it is this topology that is invariant. And that's the type of modeling that we wish to perform. A population of neurons, even if the parameters are distributed, they give rise to a particular dynamics that we wish to characterize by a state flow that is an unambiguous uh, uh, representation of the dynamics, even if you change the parameters, as long as the phase flow remains topologically invariant, we deal with the same system. Yeah? And uh, this can be performed uh, in, using different mean field techniques and you, uh, dealing with different um, uh, neural population models. Here you have an example 
uh, from one of the models that we uh, developed ourselves. Uh, so here you see a simulation of 40 Fitzhugh Nagumo neurons. This here is the membrane, membrane voltage of a single neuron. Each this here is uh, the a variable re uh, representing the opening probability of the channels. And what you saw here was a, distribute, a distribution of initial conditions, about 40 neurons that are uh, coupled. And what you see here in this particular case, they go down to a fixed point. So that corresponded to a discharge. A site like this uh, corresponds to an action potential. And the system rests at the fixed point, and the red cross represents your mean field. So in this case, it's a good representation of the mean field dynamics, whereas the step from here to here, it's the identical system. All I have changed a little bit is the dispersion of the parameters. Otherwise, all parameters are identical. And what you see is actually that here, uh, the population splits actually in three clusters. Yeah? So the parameters are identical except the dispersion of one single parameter, in this particular case the threshold, is a little wider. And you see that the behavior is completely different. The mean field is absolutely meaningless. It does not capture the characteristics. You have to actually two, three population, one that is hanging out here at the fixed point, so shows sub-threshold oscillations. You see how it moves to left, right, and then two populations that fire in antiphase. So we can capture this type of behavior. It will not work with the mean field firing rate dynamics. And in particular, this will be important when you deal with time delays, because when time delays do not matter when you have fixed points or equilibrium states. But as soon as you have oscillatory dynamics, it becomes a very, a very important issue. So if you believe that rhythms and oscillations in the brain play a role, you have to take this type of approach and consider time delays. So this can be done. Uh, this can be done here in particular, for instance, in the two-dimensional stefanescu yerza model, where you can take coupled Fitzhugh Nagumu neurons for global coupling and collapse it then mathematically on the individual clusters that you saw, so you can obtain a mode representation of the population dynamics. And you get a dimensional reduction from very high dimensional to low dimensional, in this case, where these variables here are still differential equations, but uh, 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 correspond to the clusters that were moving as population means within the state space that I showed you. And you obtain a very good representation of the qualitative features of the dynamics. Here you have the fully microscopic network model. So we are still talking about one single population, one single neural mass. Uh, in this case, composed of, let's say, uh, a few hundred neur uh, neurons. This is the dispersion of the, the threshold parameter I spoke about, and that's the coupling strength. And you have highly synchronized dynamics here. Uh, then you have partially synchronized dynamics here with multistable solutions, and you have desynchronized behavior here. So this is a fully microscopic network. And when you represent this uh, complex behavior in the same parameter space, but reproduce it with a reduced system using these population modes, you see that many features quantitatively are different, but the characteristics of the parameter space are the same. You identify the correct regions and how they change, where the critical lines of changes from one behavior to the other are to be found. And this is actually what we want to do in the virtual brain. Here you have another example of a full uh, network model based on single neuron simulations, again dispersion, and here you have a time delay parameter. Um, uh, what we have done here is that we took now a two-dimensional sheet with local couplings, uh, probabilistic coupling of individual neurons, and then long-range connection, exactly the way we have it uh, in large-scale brain networks, where we have a melange, a mix between global connectivity and local connectivity. And the, uh, the major point is if we replace this, continuously dis uh, sh this continuous sheet composed of distributed neurons with this type of connection characteristics by a network of coupled neural masses, can we represent the topology 
of the different behaviors in the parameter space. This is what you find here. So here I changed the propagation velocity along the fibers, dispersion of the parameter. This is a synchronization index, large synchronization, desynchronization. You see a wavy feature. And if we reduce the number of neurons in the fully microscopic network, we arrive at a smoothening out of this wavy structure in the uh, microscopic network, and if we uh, now replace all the neurons by low-dimensional representations of neural masses that has still the same uh, 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 topology of connectivity, then we actually represent uh, or reproduce these parametric changes in the topology of the parameter space. Quantitatively, it's wrong, but I don't care. What we want to do is we want to build human brains on this macroscopic level of description and then manipulate our parameters in order to understand the changes, maybe due to pathology, maybe due to pharmacology, of parameters, the qualitative changes of parameters uh, on this reduced level of description. So this is a mindset. And for this, we have developed over the last 10 years a simulation platform that allows us to bring all these features together, informatics, visualization, computation, simulation, stochastic with time delays, etc. So this group came together the first time in 2005, and the virtual brain itself uh, project has uh, started in 2010. It was funded by uh, the James McDonald Foundation. It was Randy McIntosh who brought all of us together. And people to be highlighted there is Petra Ritter from uh, Berlin, who is responsible for the educational platform, Kathy Price, who is leading the clinical efforts, uh, Randy, I already mentioned, who is the coordinator of the group, and I'm responsible for the technological developments of the platform. So the idea is introduce, yeah? Uh, Realistic connectivity in three-dimensional physical space for individual subjects, individual patients, so patient-specific, spe handle the data, geometry and connectivity in a three-dimensional space, and introduce neural mass modeling to different levels of representation and a degree of complexity in order to perform large-scale brain simulations. Um, we have chosen to, uh, as a front end, we have chosen a, a browser-based operation. You can download all the information from our website and also the software. The software itself is open source and runs on either a high-performance cluster or on your laptop, on my laptop, so depending on the complexity that you uh, wish to use at the core is a simulator with all the difficulties and complexities I talked about, time delays, representation of neural masses. It has to be scalable for different patient brains. We bring in all the information about structural connectivity, coupling, time delays, the geometry, cortical surface, different models. The uh, TVB is uh, completely model agnostic. There are different algorithms for the simulation available, and they, it links directly through forward solutions to EG, MEG, Bolt Signal, or uh, SEG, Stereotactic EG, as I will show you later. This is a snapshot of the interface. Uh, so where you define the uh, different population uh, models, uh, parcellations play a role. You have a connectivity editor, which is uh, one very important feature because what you want to do is you want to load in your connectome for a patient and then you want to quantify it using the brain connectivity toolbox developed by Olaf Sporns and colleagues, for instance. You want to visualize the time delays as a function of the connectivity. You want to introduce lesion, uh, lesions and basically uh, work with the connectivity matrix. And then you can perform simulations and visualize it again in 3D. Here we have a parcellation of 96 areas for two hemispheres with subcortical uh, areas included. And you see the areas actually for 96 are actually pretty big. Um, you uh, 
uh, here in this case, you have a representation of the local field potential. And you can put the uh, skull around that and calculate the EG, again, time resolved, and then basically treat it as if it were uh, experimental data. You can uh, focus on individual areas and basically uh, manipulate individual uh, time series. It's not a data analysis platform. It's really focused on the simulation and the treatment of the data and uh, bringing everything uh, together. So, um, uh, this was a graphical user interface. There is a Python command line interface. Um, all of us um, mostly work on the command line interface, but for the less experienced user, in particular when you want to do visualization, the graphical user interface is actually very, uh, very useful. All the pictures you will see today have been made, almost all the pictures have been made by TVB and are coming out of this. Uh, just as a proof of concept for the generic nature of the platform, when the Allen Atlas uh, for uh, the mouse connectom came out, we basically downloaded the data and we uh, read it in uh, into TVB and it worked without any problems. Here you have the uh, connectivity, yeah, time delays, uh, uh, sorry, uh, fiber tracks, uh, fiber track lengths, and this is the. Uh, surface yeah, within the TVB interface. We've not worked with it yet. We just start working with that, which will give us a very nice uh, validation of all these DTI-based approaches as compared to the uh, tracker-based uh, connectome that we obtained here. Yeah? So, a little overview of uh, the background that is within TVB. I told you it's agnostic with regard to the a uh, neural mass model. Everyone has certain preferences, whether you look at firing rate-based models or oscillatory models. We're not dealing with single neural models. Yeah? It's all based on the population level. And these are the models that are currently implemented and it's uh, open source. And uh, there are more and more models coming from the outside uh, community being contributed and uh, then implemented in the uh, official version. Yeah? So. Um, but all of the models which needs to be emphasized are described by ordinary differential equations. So all of the neural mass models and what we have implemented there is actually a nice phase flow visualizer. So you implement the equations mathematically. You can, and then you can visualize uh, the equations through their, now you have to know mathematics a little bit, through the null clients. The intersections are the fixed points. You click somewhere here, and it basically does, you, it takes a point where you clicked and make, as an initial condition. It shows you different trajectories, and then you can here change the parameters and introduce dispersion of parameters. It's very useful. I like myself. I like to work visually like this rather than changing the parameters. I uh, you get immediately in a uh, visual impression of how the flow changes, whether it's a limit cycle that comes up, etc working with these phase flows. And then the time series uh, uh, occur immediately. Mathematically, we have this as, uh, this rough, basically the uh, essential part of the TBB equation. It is a differential equation with integral terms and time delays, where this represents the neural mass model. X is space, the cortical space on the cortical surface, or subcortical areas which are centered uh, uh, in between and below the two uh, hemispheres. Then you have local connectivity, which does not undergo a delay, a connectivity function that needs to be specified, and again, is arbitrary that you can specify. And the global connectivity coming from typically DTI data undergoes a time delay, with a time delay is identical to a scaled, uh, the fiber length that you have and uh, scaled by your velocity. For the coupling functions, there are different uh, choices that can be made, and as usual, it depends on the modeler and what you want to do. Uh, geometry, parcellations, certain choices need to be made. Yeah? So this is a representative uh, parcellation for the 96 areas. Uh, we are the, the interior cortex is being tessellated, 
and then you can make tessellated, and typically we have something between 10 to 100,000 vertex points for both hemispheres. Uh, then you have to make a modeling choice. You can either take a brain area, uh, as in your parcellation, as a network, mode, uh, a network node, then you basically run this mode of operation and you can still represent it in uh, uh, this geometry to calculate forward solutions, or you can perform surface-based modeling, but then you have a significantly higher dimensionality where you take basically every single vertex point and perform a high-dimensional network simulation. This is, for instance, something that we do on our high-performance cluster because it takes a significant time. The code is not paralyzed, but when we perform parameter sweeps, you can run on each core a parameter configuration independently, but there you can basically let, let it run. So here we do uh, what I typically use is 16,800, 140,000 we have done only once as a proof of concept. Yeah. So TVB connectivity, data are coming from DTI data, then they are represented in this matrix, connecti structural connectivity matrix, brain areas, plotted, uh, plugged into other brain areas. Uh, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, interhemispheric connections, represented in 3D. Then, as I told you, either local coupling for the surface-based modeling, you have a local connectivity and the large-scale connectivity, so both can be treated independently. For the local connectivity, you can choose different type of connectivity functions that are then defined over the curved surface of the cortex. And uh, you can introduce, yeah, here you have a representation of the local coupling on the curved surface here in Gaussian type of local coupling as it decays from this point. And uh, one feature that is very important is then the time delay. And this, as I said earlier, we get from the um, tracked lengths. Here you have a representation of the connectivity over the time delays. Uh, as, uh, so basically, we deal with a tensor yeah, matrix and then a third dimension that plots the time delays which you have to carry along. Yeah. Parameters can be dispersed and you can stimulate individual areas. Again, the stimulation location can also be dispersed. So that's roughly the current functionality. You can run systematic parameter space explorations within the platform and basically perform simplest analysis such as variance, synchronization index. But as I said, if you want to perform a more detailed analysis, download the data and load it into Curry or some uh, better professional software that is, dealing, that is focused on uh, analysis. Yeah. Um, applications. Most of it so far has been done for the resting state and there uh, the general approach using TVB has been the following. You load in your connectivity matrix, you build a parcellation and the geometry of the cortex, basically build your brain model, you put in your neural mass model on each brain area. So most of these modeling studies have performed region-based modeling rather than surface-based modeling. Actually, only one has uh, performed, sur no, two have uh, performed surface-based modeling. And then you uh, run your model and you get uh, your time series out of the neural mass. If it's firing rate or local field potential, it depends on your uh, neural mass model. Using the balloon wind castle model, which is implemented, it gives you the bolt signal. And then you start uh, comparing it to empirical data. One possibility mostly used is you compute a functional connectivity matrix, brain region on brain region and a cross-correlation or covariance between brain regions. This gives you a matrix and you compare and fit and optimize your parameters when comparing it to the empirical functional connectivity matrix. So I mentioned non-stationarity has been a big issue and uh, the functional connectivity matrices are typically not fit to capture these non-stationarities, but uh, studying the model has helped us a lot to... Uh, the non-stationarities are also present in the model. Yeah? 
uh, that's a different talk, but the model has helped us a lot to understand the nature of the non-stationary behavior within the resting state, and then has taught us how to change our analysis in order to get a better and deeper understanding of the resting state activity and the non-stationarities present in the functional connectivity. Yeah? So, and uh, lesioning uh, is performed with lesion patient studies by Anna Solotkin in California. That is another branch that is coming, uh, being pushed forward. What I want to do is, I want to, this is where my heart is closest to at the moment, is uh, epilepsy. Yeah? And uh, this is preliminary work. Some aspects have been published, but I want to uh, show you the vision where we want to go, what we want to do. Yeah? This is specific patient data of a female patient out of our uh, clinics, 30 years old, uh, so local, Marseille. And uh, we reconstructed her uh, geometry, cortical and subcortical, which is not that necessary. We are not using this information, but the cortical is important. And the connectome, yeah? So this is a representation of the fiber tracts of this particular patient. And uh, then this is a representation, a log matrix of uh, the weights, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, interhemispheric, and the lengths of this particular patient, of the tracks of this particular patient. This is experimental data, and uh, with this patient, oh, a few general words. 1% uh, uh, of the human population has epilepsy, suffers from epilepsy. Yeah? A third of this 1% is uh, pharmaceutically resistant, so their only hope for relief is actually surgery. And um, pre-surgical, um, treatment or analysis is EG, MEG, we do also MEG, and uh, fMRI. And you basically take what you get in order to find out where is the epileptogenic zone that then shall be the target or one of the possible targets for uh, uh, surgical removal. Yeah? Uh, what is being done uh, in our clinics also is SEG, stereotactic EEG, which has been developed by Talarak and Banco. These are individual needles, about that length. Yeah? You have about 10 electrodes on each needle, spaced uh, multiple millimeters away from each other. And it's a, vol a volumetric approach. You see them here. So these are the needles that were introduced in the patient's brain. Yeah? So initially it was uh, thought based on the analysis of EEG, and MRI and fMRI, where uh, the uh, clinicians were looking for uh, seizure uh, for uh, lesions, uh, it was thought that it is uh, mostly on the uh, right hemisphere. Yeah, no, sorry, on the left hemisphere, and uh, so they placed eight electrodes on the left hemisphere: one, two, three, four, five, and uh, six, and uh, two vertical and two other electrodes on the other hemisphere because it was suspected there may be also a part of the epileptogenic zone. Yeah? So each point represents an electrode. And they are color-coded. And these are the time series. So these are roughly... Uh, uh, this would... Uh, so the dynamics here, that would be roughly one minute, 30 seconds, something like that. The time scale doesn't matter here so much. Yeah, roughly one minute. Uh, 10 time series for the brown electrode with the individual points, and then other color, other color, other color. So that is the setup. This is what you observe. That would be the resting state of the SEG. Typically, these needles are being kept for two weeks in the brain, and the patient is being monitored 24 hours out of 24. Yeah? Here you see interactal spikes yeah? in the, uh, in the uh, blue electrode here. And here you see a simple seizure. But please note, the simple seizure starts on the other hemisphere, on the right hemisphere, where actually we have only two electrodes, and not here on the left hemisphere, where the patient uh, received eight electrodes. So a simple seizure means it uh, starts locally and it stays locally. And a... Uh, 
This year you have a zoom into the seizure dynamics and this is very characteristic for uh, uh, seizure development, fast, uh, so spontaneous on onset, fast discharge, development of a spike wave complex uh, determined by a big amplitude spike, fast discharges, and then the uh, slowing down quiet zone and then discharge again, yeah? So this is, uh, here we are on the second range, yeah? From here to here, that's roughly 10 seconds, yeah? But it happens on the right hemisphere, and here you have a complex partial seizure, which means actually the seizure starts here again on the right hemisphere, yeah? Please see. Uh, the, when the amplitude gets high of the discharges, yeah, I increase the size of the uh, sphere representing the location in the brain of the patient. Yeah? And then it propagates to the other hemisphere, into these areas. So that's actually uh, hippocampus and uh, a, a thalamic structure. You will see that in detail. Yeah? So this is actually the uh, propagation from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. So we took this brain, we reconstructed it, we uh, uh, implemented neural mass models that are capable of performing this type of seizure dynamics with the temporal features that I uh, described to you. Uh, we implemented a, a forward model of structural EEG. So what you see here is the mm, needles, like in the patient, this is not the virtual brain, yeah? the needles are uh, implemented at the same locations and they, uh, the network nodes from all of the patient are the brain regions uh, represented by the red dots. So this is what we did not see in the patient data. What we see in the patient data is only what is measured by these needles. The network nodes are in red and this is what we used for modeling. The time series are here and here you see a spontaneous simple uh, uh, seizure. And what you can do with a virtual brain approach, and that is beneficial. So this has been published in uh, Brain just recently, and we will get something out in uh, Journal of Neuroscience with regard to the uh, coupling and the actual virtualization is, uh, of the interpatient is still in preparation. But what we can do with regard to the mathematics is, now we can perform mathematics because the models are lower dimensional. For the epileptogenic zone, we use the clinician's eye to identify us what are the candidates. That gives us uh, settings of parameters where we can increase the epileptogenicity parameter in the model. Yeah? And we can perform a linear stability analysis using the connectome of this particular patient plus the distribution of the parameters in order to calculate the paths of propagation, of seizure propagation, as we observed it in the data. That gives us a setting of epileptogenicity parameters that we can implement in the model. And then we can systematically scan and vary the other parameters that we believe that are relevant. Yeah? This is what we are doing here. So we have actually a low dimensional parameter set inspired by the uh, clinical knowledge Mathematical analysis that determines then a low dimensional parameter set that we can computationally vary. These are the results. So here you see the simple seizure propagation, it stays here. And then for uh, the zoom, the fast discharges, so this is without noise now, the fast discharges and the slowing down development of a spike wave complex and the termination of the simple seizure. And here the complex seizure. Yeah. Starting on the right hemisphere, so hepileptogenicity values are higher on the right hemisphere and on the left uh, uh, hemisphere. It starts here on the right hemisphere, hippocampus. In red, uh, you see the activity of the neural mass model in TVB, but this is what is measured through the forward solution in the SEG electrode. Then it continues. It spreads to the thalamus. Please note that in the thalamus we have augmentation of the activity, which we did not see in the SEG because there were no uh, uh, electrodes in there. But the mathematical analysis showed us actually that the propagation always, in this particular case, for this distribution of epileptogenicity values, always has to go through the thalamus, which we did not before, uh, know before. That from the thalamus, it recruits the left hippocampus and goes to the temporal lobe, to the left temporal lobe, 
fast discharges here and basically then terminates. Initially, the mathematical analysis showed us that in order we will never be able to get this propagation here uh, deterministically, but with uh, simulations of noise, it turned out actually, in the presence of noise, the order flips of how the individual areas are being uh, recruited. Yeah? And this is uh, reproducible. The underlying mathematical mechanism for this we don't understand yet fully, but this is what we observed in the simulations. So uh, here once again in the video, it starts on uh, the right hemisphere. Please note here how it increases the activity, brown areas. Then it travels through the thalamus, increased activity and recruits on the left hemisphere, uh, perihippocampus and uh, temporal lobe. Again, dynamically represented, scaling up the size of the individual red blobs. In the other colors, you have the SEG needles. So this is what we're doing. Initially, the patient has not been considered for surgery because the epileptogenic zone is on both hemispheres. So that's an immediate stop for surgery. Now there are renegotiations with the clinicians. We see if we can find different avenues, etc., at least to stop the seizure from propagation. But again, that is the vision for the future, uh, though this is what we're doing, uh, working together with our clinical colleagues. So, in summary, uh, the vision is to develop individualizable uh, simulators on this macroscopic, the large-scale brain network level of organization to ask questions that are appropriate to ask on this level of organization, namely brain connectivity, to reproduce uh, invasive and non-invasive neuroimaging data in a realistic fashion, so that requires all the neuroinformatics efforts to put them together in order to have an immediately usable, yeah, open source uh, platform for simulation available that allows us basically to uh, vary in pathologies parameters that are linked to this macroscopic level, and that's typically connectivity. Yeah? And as I showed you in the beginning, many pathologies have at least a connectivity component that we'd like to address here. Many people are involved in this. These are our funding agencies that have helped us to develop uh, at least uh, different parts of the virtual brain platform, and people I would like to highlight that are contributing heavily to this is, of course, Randy, Gustavo, Petra, and this is my team and the clinical team that is working with us on uh, this project. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, on, on one of your slides, you were showing, I think, um, some kind of forward model. I'm not sure whether I understood it. You showed this model wave of parameters, and then you create data from which you create a connectivity matrix, and this connectivity matrix you compare with the real connectivity matrix. And then I think the idea was to optimize the parameters in your model to fit the, the real data. Yeah. So I was wondering, how do you um, handle the problem that you can run in some kind of local optimum when you try to optimize these parameters, in particular when it comes to clinical applications? Yeah. So parameter optimization is uh, not the focus of this here, because that is part of the outside analysis. That was the one slide where I showed you how it has been done with regard to the resting state. It was actually quite critical with regard to this optimization, because the functional connectivity is uh, kind of questionable, that depending on how, what metric, uh, what measure you choose for the functional connectivity, uh, there are many assumptions be behind that. So I'd be uh, very 
cautious with regard to the optimization because even the metric that we use here, uh, I would look at it own, uh, very carefully. Yes? So we have not invested much effort at the moment with regard to the optimization of this. Yeah? What we are doing, what we are, I pointed this out because it has been done in some studies in order to find an optimal operating point. And there, uh, with regard to optimization, what has been done until uh, then is a greedy search, number one, and uh, using many different initial conditions, typically a thousand initial conditions in the uh, parameter space. But more sophisticated aspects or approaches have not been performed so far. What we have focused upon is, uh, and because you asked for, with regard to clinical approaches, is to take an approach where we uh, perform an informed parameter search where we perform the simulations for different parameter settings, but in a low dimensional parameter space, as I showed you with the epileptic patient, yeah, that we perform an initial mathematical analysis using all expert eye clinical knowledge, like the Fabrice Bartolomé, our uh, head of epilepsy, he told us basically we would identify these areas as the epileptogenic zone. This we took as a starting. Uh, um, point, then we performed the linear stability analysis and identified all the different paths that the system can take. Yeah? And then we had a reduced set of parameters that we then computationally sweep out, perform uh, the simulations. Yeah? And then it depends again on what metric you use uh, effectively to represent propagation of an epileptic seizure. That's non-trivial also. Do you look at signatures of synchronization, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm actually uh, very cautious with regard to optimization because what you optimize when you look at so complex uh, phenomena, yeah? Sorry, it is a kind of complicated answer, but it is a very complicated problem. So this is a probably a related question that goes to the question of uh, stability in large nonlinear dynamical systems. So I wonder with all of these um, weight matrices that you get from your connectomes and so on, whether you have any sense of what it requires to keep your systems bounded and whether there's anything about the way that you build the model which uh, addresses this point. <coughs> Maybe uh, also comment on the... the um, possible function of instabilities. Yeah. Uh, can uh, just for clarification, when you say to keep the system bounded, do you mean algorithmically bounded, uh, so to say that the algorithms converge, or bounded in order not to explode, go away from an unstable fixed point? Dynamically bounded. Dynamically bounded, OK. So uh, the question is, uh, when, when we have so many parameters, neural mass models, we build the network and uh, we have no idea uh, where to start with the different parameters. How can we uh, make sure that our starting point uh, is not somewhere in a parameter space where the system basically uh, explodes? Uh, so uh, what we are doing is uh, the default settings of, it depends a little on uh, uh, what the task is. And so far, much of the work is focused on resting state conditions. Yeah? So neural, uh, the approach has been take the neural ma uh, mass models in uh, the default settings. All of them have an equilibrium point. And then they differ if they are able to show limit cycle oscillations, et cetera, et cetera. But you start at the equilibrium point, and then uh, connectom, uh, connectivity is at zero, C equals zero, and the first parameter you start increasing as you keep the topology of the connectom uh, invariant, and then you start increasing the scaling, the scalar scaling of the connectom, and you guide the system through a series of bifurcations purely through the connectivity. So you do not touch the parameter in the neural mass models. Unless, of course, you have questions about distributions of excitability or epileptogenicity, as we had with the epileptic patient. But with the resting state, we kept all of them invariant. This is essentially due to the experimenter's eye, this space. Yeah. Uh, we have not used any automatic method. We have worked very close uh, with the empirists together, so ex it's close to the experimental eye, yes.
Thank you.